Hello my soccer universe and welcome to the first uh, review of a Champions League group stage. Well, let's get the obvious out <laughs> first. Yes, I have different glasses for now. I'm getting replacement glasses. And yeah, looks a little, a little bit weird. We'll get there. But yeah, um, overall, if I now take out my personal preferences, namely Milan, I think it was a really enjoyable first round. We had quite a few surprises in there. Even at least one major upset in there as well. We had tons of goals. We already had three goals per game, which is way above average. So that's good. Although I think the late flurry in Munich definitely had to do something with that. And yeah, I um, think it's time that we uh, jump right in. I want to start on Tuesday evening. The opening game, if you would like, Milan against Newcastle. Um, the one thing I have to say, Milan played really well. They bounced well back from the uh, derby uh, humiliation that they suffered um, and created many, many chances, most of which uh, Eddie Pope could save. There were some good saves in there as well. But I have to say, Leao, 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 what are you thinking? The one scene where he runs through the defense and beats another player, and beats another, beats another, free on goal. And what does he try to do? A back heel? Are you freaking kidding me? A back heel right there? Get your, you need to get the goal by any means, not by the flashes. Mean. And this is what frustrates me with Leo, because he is obviously by far the best player on this squad. I mean, it, I think the, the, the gap um, got a little bit closer now, but he is by far the best player on this squad. But he's sometimes so nonchalant, it just uh, ticks me off. Speaking of ticking me off, I mean, first half, I think if Milan would have led by 2-0, this would have been a just reflection of that game. Of course, we also have to talk about Sandro Tonali, who got a really nice reception by the Ultras. Um, I always heard some whistles, I think, when Newcastle were attacking, but I think it was more about Newcastle than about Tonali himself. And when he came off, he also got a standing ovation. Maybe he did not endear himself uh, too much to Newcastle fans by saying he cannot hide his passion for Milan. But, you know, this was Italian journalist and I wouldn't pay too much credence in there. He will always work hard. But I have to say, I really overall liked what I saw. But the finishing was just sometimes very, very off. It was also a good bounce back in a sense that Newcastle, like Inter, hung in deep. However, unlike Inter, they didn't have to punch going forward and didn't catch out the Milan defense that was also a little bit reformed. I also have to ask a little bit the lineup choice why you bring on Pobega. Maybe you want to give Randers a rest, but then Randers doesn't have an injury record. However, Loftus Cheek does. And you play Loftus Cheek, who then has to come off and so on. So, you know, there were quite a few things in there. But uh, so, first half, really good. Second half, I mean, uh, barely any chance except again a Leo shot and I think a Leo header. And then a few blocked sh shots when Pulisic came on. Uh, but that was ba ba basically the second half was a, was a bit more of a letdown. Still, Milan could have scored. Newcastle had barely any shots on goal. I was really, really disappointed. But what really ticked, ticked me off was the referee who was so picky and gave yellow cards especially to Milan players for almost nothing whereas Newcastle players I mean yes there was an elbow by Fabian Scher but I honestly I thought this was a little bit non-reflective of how the game was played so that was num number one and then of course the Mike Mignon injury in the 81st minute that guy had nothing to do and he has an uh, upper thigh injury. How? This is the same same type of injury that happened uh, like a year ago when he was playing for France in a game against Austria. We had nothing to do. He had to come off at, at, at the half. I'm worried. I mean, at least now with Sportiello, we have, uh, we, Milan has a, a decent backup. But yeah, I was not very, very happy with that. Other than that, yeah. I think I covered most of that game and I don't need to say much more. It is a, it is two points dropped for Milan right there, which of course did not increase their chances for qual qualifying. But anyway, when you look at it at the beginning of this, you said, yeah, probably it's a tight one between Milan and Newcastle. Um, positive performance, that's what I'm taking from that. 
uh, and a good bounce back from the derby. And we'll talk at the very end about Inter, where it was more or less the exact opposite. Uh, let's stay in the same group with PSG against Dortmund. Um, that was one-way traffic. Yes, Dortmund had a few chances early on. Uh, Sabitzer had to come, come up with a muscle injury. Um, when PSG took the lead, it was a Mbappe penalty that was a little bit nitpicky. And then Hakimi, uh, former Borussia Dortmund player, scores an admittedly nice 2 2 nil. was not much to talk home, home about, but except that the uh, really old PSG Champions League jerseys with the orange numbers don't get that, you know, <laughs> there's a reason why I'm hanging the brown shirt here. Um, so that is it for uh, um, Group uh, F. We have uh, in Group E, we had a really, really classic matchup between Feyenoord and Celtic. On second ever meeting between those two. The first one came in the 1970 European Cup final where Feyenoord ushered in the Dutch era, if you like, and becoming the first Dutch team to win what was then the European uh, Cup. Uh, the game, actually, probably Celtic had a little bit more of the game overall, but it was even, uh, Feyenoord was struggling, and then they took the lead just before for the half with a Stengs free kick, newly acquired, where the Celtic vault did not look good. I mean, it's parting like the Red Sea from Moses. Um, and then things get worse for uh, Celtic, for Celtic they give up a penalty with a second yellow card, player off, Igor Peshaw sees his penalty safe, but then another uh, a red card, this time straight for Holm. And so uh, it was only going one way. Feyenoord then scored actually a go-ahead goal. It was called back by Gertreuda, and but in the end it's Johan Baksh in the 76 who gets the second goal. And Feyenoord get a second win over Celtic in a game that I really enjoyed. But what was well, what made me most happy is what happened at the end of the Lazio Atleti game. Um, you know, it was a game where Lazio tried to control the game, of course. Uh, Simeone, former Lazio player, he won the championship with him. He a really good welcome there. And there are so many connections here between all these teams, to be honest, that I could spend probably another video on. Um, but Atleti played Atleti style, defending deep, and then uh, they get a lead through Barrios that was horribly deflected. Uh, other days, it was more or less their first shot on goal. I mean, there was a Griezmann chance that he more or less stumbled over. Uh, but yeah, I felt that Lazio deserved more from that. In the second half, once Lazio opened up more, of course, Atleti had a few more chances. They could have put the game to bed as well, but I think this would not have been a fair reflection of the game. And so in the end, it is <laughs> Provedel, the goalie, who scores the equalizer. Uh, the story, with it was basically, uh, they had a, um, a, a corner kick, he came up for that, for, for, for that one. They thought they get a penalty. No, it was not on the given day. Play on. And then the ball falls to Luis, Luis Alberto, and Provedel, like a striker, attacks that ball and heads it in the internet. This was my scene of the entire uh, matches there because how often do you see a goalie scoring? Um, we had a young boys losing at home to Leipzig. It was 1 1 for a while, but Leipzig, Leipzig got a better team. I mean, they could have scored three times already in the first, within the first five minutes and got the lead very early there. City found themselves 1 0 down at the half, completely against the run of play. I mean, the, the chances that City missed, I think they hit, hit, hit him the crossbar in, in there. And that was really something else. Uh, but then Julian Alvarez, just a few seconds after kickoff, gets the 1 1. Uh, he also gets the 2 1, but that did not look good on the goalie and then the rotary makes it 3-1 and it's the expected win for them uh, I'm wearing Barcelona simply because they had the biggest win uh, and they really took uh, Antwerp they showed them welcome to the Champions League let, let's whatever and it's uh, Jean Felice who again he scores the first one, he assists Lewandowski on the second one. Uh, there was an own goal in there, then Gavis comes in and Joao Felic scores another one. Uh, I think this Barcelona team starts to look really, really good. Um, I want to see them against, against a top opponent. Let's put, put, put it that way. And in the other game, played in Hamburg, because Schachtel can unfortunately play at home. Uh, Porto took an early lead. That was then quickly equalized, but then uh, Galeno scores another one. Uh, Taremi, who actually was linked to Milan, uh, makes it 3-1 before the half, and that was the game. So the two favorites in that group already are in control. Um, then yesterday, 
As I said, I was out. I did not see all that much. What, what, what I saw is that Galatasaray uh, actually cont- uh, had many chances to take take it in against the run of play. El Yunusi gives Copenhagen hang a lead and Gonzalez doubles the lead uh, on the hour mark, more or less. And it looks like they had completely taken out the steam from um, uh, Galatasaray. However, a red card in the 73rd, a yellow red, uh, kind of tilts again things towards Galatasaray, but it's still going. And then again, Boy and uh, Tete equalizing the 86th and the 88th, um, getting a result. But honestly, I would have expected Galatasaray to beat Copenhagen, and that probably does not bode well for their chances uh, going forward. Bayern against United was the expected. Uh, Bayern lead, uh, very comfortable, very weird jersey matchup. This was probably the worst jer- jer- jersey matchup that I've ever seen for between these two teams. And I included crazy Bayern shirt that they lost the final in. Lira Sane and Serge Gnabry give Bayern a very comfortable tunnel lead. However, Rasmus Hoyland, a little bit out, out of nowhere, pulls one back, but almost immediately they concede another uh, penalty. And Kane makes it 3-1. And you think... That's the game. Nothing's gonna happen any, any, any anymore. And there was not much trying. I mean, everyone kind of resigned to the fact that this is an easy Bayern win. Until Casemiro pokes one in in the 88th. However, Matthias Tell, who just had come on for Thomas Müller, uh, quickly restores the two-goal cushion. Only for a few minutes later, Carl Casemiro again putting one in. And uh, so a game that I think a two-goal uh, difference would have been more reflective of the game. 4-3, yes, it's great. There were many goals scored, but uh, it also shows that Bayern is kind of vulnerable at this very moment. Speaking of vulnerable, I mean, PSV daringly tried to play with Arsenal wide open. I mean, this is a game. I think PSV is a really good team. But... They were taking advantage of so much with this one. Uh, Bukayo Saka already in the eighth throw. Uh, Leandro Tos and Gabo Gabriel Jesus was 3 0 at the half. Odegaard adds a fourth one. This was a schooling for PSV. One that you did not expect given their really, really great uh, league form overall. Uh, and in the same group, we had uh, Lars fighting to a 1 1 draw in Sevilla. I mean, Ocampos with a, a wicked header. Gives them the lead and then Fulgini in the 24th equalizes. Um, for most of the time, uh, Sevilla had more of the game, but late, late on there was even a chance for Lance to win it. Then uh, we go to another early, early game. Only a building held their own for about a half at the Real Madrid. In the second half, it was a veritable onslaught uh, with Real Madrid hitting the crossbar, uh, hitting the woodwork, uh, creating chances. Union doing what Union does the, the best, staying tight at the back, and they really thought they had it until a ball, basically, it was uh, more or less a pinball move. Uh, it was a wide red shot, they got the flag, the flag it falls to Bellingham, who can put it in, into the empty net. Who else is scoring for Real Madrid? And Real Madrid get off to a start uh, late on. It was not glorious, it was not glamorous, but it's three points, and for Union Berlin, they will have a story to tell that they played at, um, at the Bernabeu. Uh, in the same group, we also had uh, Napoli largely uh, dominating the game at Braga with Di Lorenzo very late uh, in the first half, getting them the the go-ahead goal. What a shot that was. I mean, it bounced up and then right into the stanchion up there. Uh, Ozyman actually should have scored at least one in, in, in the first half. But Napoli fall in the, in the same trap a, a little bit. They let it go. And then out of nowhere, Bruma gets an equalizer in the 84th minute. And you think that, oh, is Napoli going to drop points? No. Just to serve, but not in a very just way, because the Zielinski coach is uh, pulled into the own net by Nier Kate when there was no Napoli uh, player around. So uh, a little bit unlucky, and you got a feel for Braga. Uh, the other Portuguese team that played on uh, Wednesday, Benfica, uh, saw the surprise of, of the last. This was Red Bull Salzburg going to Lisbon, where they had the Roger Schmidt as coach, who, of course, kickstarted the revolution, the Red Bull style. And very early on, there was already um, a penalty given that Konate actually put over the bar. And I was reminded that two years ago, Sal played at Sevilla where they had three penalties and missed two. So I thought, is this going to start out again? They get another one and one of the most stupidest penalties that they'll ever see. I think the ball comes from the crossbar and Antonio Silva 
touches it with his hand. Right on the goal line. I mean, it's handling in the in in the box. It's another penalty, and it's a red card. And this time, Roko Simic, uh, who was outstanding on this evening, makes it one 0 Then onslaught with the, even with a man less onslaught by Benfica. Uh, really putting Salzburg under pressure. Alex Schlager from last goalie uh, having a great game. Reminded me of his performance in Eindhoven in 2019. Um, and then on, uh, early in the second half, they catch out Benfica on another break where Simic has, has the ball. Uh, he's not offside and then he uh, passes it over to Gluck, who becomes the youngest Israeli goal scorer ever in the Champions League. This Salzburg squad then held on to this 2-0 uh, lead. And this is the youngest ever Champions League squad that has been pulled out. So a mega achievement for, Salz for Salzburg. They consider this among the best, if not the best, performance they ever had in the champ in the Champions League, and headlines in Austria are uh, accordingly. And then, honestly, Real Sociedad should have won against Inter. Uh, yes, it was not a red, red card for Barella. I think uh, I was actually okay, but Real Sociedad had many chances. I don't know. This was the Inter team that uh, played so brilliantly against Milan. Although Milan played in their cards, I think it was more a Milan loss than an Inter win. A bad, bad Milan loss. Um, but in the last 50 minutes, Inter just kicked it into the next gear and then they get the goal uh, through Lauter La La Martinez, the Tiram goal already had been not been given by, uh, for off offside. But Real, uh, Real Sociedad should have put this to bed early on. And so we see here the standings uh, and, you know, the bars show who is improving and not. I leave you here uh, with uh, the different group standings. And we also move then further uh, to the... Winners and losers, you see the two Red Bull teams, this is not just purely by the numbers, are the big winners. Uh, whereas losers, of course, Braga, Dortmund and Benfica, who uh, definitely did not improve their chances of advancing. As for the overall favorites, it's still Manchester City to lose. Bayern is in there, Arsenal is in there, Real Madrid is in there, maybe Barcelona. It's going to be interesting. I don't think, I, mean, I would like that the Italian teams are doing well. But I don't really can see it happening. And then we see in two weeks' time we have the next round. Uh, again, interesting set of things. We have Napoli against Real Madrid. We have Inter against Benfica. I think those are the two stands outside. Uh, I'm curious also if Salzburg, if they can get a win against Real Sociedad, then I think they are uh, real money to uh, move on. Uh, loss against R Arsenal. This has some 90s vibes to me. Then uh, Dortmund against Milan. I think... Milan have a horrible uh, record in Dortmund, I have to say, Newcastle against PSG. And we have also Porto against Barcelona. I uh, think those are the uh, games to watch out for. So yeah, longer v v video, but many games to talk about. This was me from the Champ, 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 Champions League. Uh, was, as I said, entertaining, fun start. And we had a goalie heroic in there and we had a mad finish in Munich that did not was not reflective of the game, but you know. Uh, what would would you say? In any case, give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Drop a comment below what you thought about uh, the games and how your team fared. And I'll talk to, to you soon. Bye. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.